All right, so uh, I'm happy to be uh, with you all this morning, spend time with you, and to look at the Word of God. And uh, so as I announced last week, or as I confessed last week, I was planning to begin a new series last week, but I failed to, because uh, I couldn't uh, uh, get to the point of being able to say that this is it. So I took another week, and finally, I'll be starting a new series. Uh, I'm, pl I'm thinking of five or so, may go more or less, but, and uh, as I said, this topic uh, will be on, uh, the topic will be on theodicy. It's a technical term, but what theodicy is, a theodicy is an attempt at explaining the, on the one hand, ex the existence of a all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God and on the other hand, the existence of this sheer evil. And people see a difficulty between uh, these two, God and evil. And this uh, theodicy, uh, what scholars call theodicy, is uh, again a, an attempt to try to solve that seeming uh, contradiction or at least difficulty there is. And so uh, this series I entitled, Why God? Faith in the Face of Other Evil. And I think this is uh, very pertinent uh, for this time. As uh, Auden has said in prayer, there's so much going on around us. And I believe that many of us has, have seen or felt evil in this moment. And, you know, uh, this series, uh, I, I should probably make a disclaimer in the beginning, but this series is not intended to explain away evil or justify evil. I want you to get that. Uh, after this series, I'm not uh, asking you to just uh, justify evil and say that evil, evil is, after all, not so bad. No, that's not my point. I hope that after this series, you would be more uh, more confident to de detest evil, to say evil, evil, to call evil, evil. And at the same time, another disclaimer that I would like to, like to make is that uh, through this series, uh, this, is, this series is not an attempt for me to show a, as a pastor, it would be weird to say this, but to uh, pastoral care. This sermon is not intended for that. This sermon is not intended uh, to heal your wounds that you may actually be suffering right now as of moment. Because in those moments of suffering, what you need might not be explanation or logics behind all these, but rather people to be there with you, you know, these people's presence and comfort. So uh, don't uh, assume that this series may uh take you out of that suffering or that pain but i hope that this series will help those of us who are wondering and trying to figure out where to put your faith in or uh, are unsure of if you can truly be confident in god who allows or who at least permits this kind of evil happening in this world and around us so that's just uh, the basic uh, idea of this series and um, this series, uh, I will be very much dependent on, dependent on this book called The Odyssey of Love, which is written by Dr. John Peckham. He's a professor at uh, Andrews University. I had a privilege to take a couple of his classes. He's an, a great thinker, a pro, pro, proficient, prolific, prolific a writer. Uh, he has published many books uh, from uh, established, uh, well, prominent uh, publishers like Baker Academic, and he's well known even in the uh, academic field outside of Seventh Day Adventist Church. So, if you are interested, it's it's a bit uh, it's written toward an academic audience, so it's a bit technical. But if you're interested in it, I would highly recommend you read it. It's not that long; it's less than 200 pages. So, if you're interested, um, this is a book recommendation. But uh, so uh, this sermon series will be uh, very much drawing from this book, and um, I hope that this will help us uh, understand better of this big problem of evil. 
So to begin with, uh, the first of this series I entitled, When God Does Not Get What He Wants. Let me repeat that. When God does not get what he wants. Now, do you think that God always gets what he wants? Right. Now, uh, let me read a quote from Epicurus. Uh, he's a Greek philosopher from, I think, 4th BC, 4th century BC. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but around that time. So a long time ago. Let's just say a long time ago. This ancient philosopher posed a qu uh, question, and Hume, uh, this is another philosopher more recent to our times, but uh, phrased it this way, said, is he, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? Such a clear question, isn't it? I mean, if God, is, if God wants to prevent evil and not able to do that, I mean, he, should be, he shouldn't be all-powerful. He shouldn't be omnipotent, right? Or, I mean, if he can prevent evil, but he is not wanting to prevent evil, then he should not be all-loving after all, right? He should be evil. Well, if he is both able, he is all-powerful and all loving, he's wanting to prevent evil, then how come there is evil in this world? And you know, that's the gist of this, this question. And such a brilliant question this is, don't you think so? I mean, how would you answer to this kind of question when it's posed to you? Such a brilliant question. And I hope that this series uh, will try to, to answer this question. And to begin that with, to begin with, uh, well, not to begin with, I guess this is again preliminary, but the title I choose for this series, Why God? I think when we are posed with this question, as Christians, we say, why God? Addressing to God, right? Why is this all happening? Why are you allowing this to happen to us? Etc. And to those who are not believers, who do not believe in God at all, they may ask us, why believe in God? I mean, you see all these evils, right? So to begin with, I would like to uh, get us uh, confront this question. Does God always get what he wants? Does God always get what he wants? What do you think about that? Is God all-powerful? Is God able to prevent evil? Is, is God omnipotent, as theologians say? Well, I would like to see uh, some of uh, biblical ver uh, verses. Let's begin with Job, to whom we will return later on in the series. He says, I know that you, God, can do how much things or how many things? He says, all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Okay, that's a pretty clear statement, isn't it? Job, after all those sufferings, he says, you can do all things. I know that, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. What about Jesus? Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. How many things? All things. Okay, this is Jesus himself saying, with God, all things are possible. How about the saints in the end of the time? At the end of the time, these eschatological saints in Revelation praise God by saying, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. For the Lord our God, the Almighty. Now, this word Almighty is literally, uh, literally means all-powerful. Okay? For the Lord our God, the all-powerful reigns. So it seems pretty clear from the biblical de descriptions that God is all-powerful and God can do all things. Right? I mean, I think it seems pretty clear. By the way, just a side note here. This, however, does not mean that he can do, like, quite literally all things. For example, in Hebrews it says, it is impossible for God to lie. Okay? So on the one hand, we could say that God can do all things. Nothing is impossible for him. At the same time, we also see that God cannot lie. Why? 
because he is just, right? So accept the things that is contrary to his nature or who he is, or that is, or things that are just absurdity, God can do all things. That is what it means that God is all powerful, right? God is all powerful does not mean that he can do absurd things or things that uh, go against his character. But at least it seems clear that he can do all things. He, everything is possible for him as long as it aligns with his nature and character. Right. And continuing on, uh, I would like to read from Isaiah. This is God himself saying, uh, I am God. Okay. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. I have spoken, I will bring it to pass. I have purpose and I will do it. This is a bold statement to make. Uh, I think that statement can be only made by God. And here I want you to notice that not only can, well, the reason why he can all do all things is also dependent on the fact that he knows the end from the beginning. He can declare the end from the beginning. On this note, another verse in Isaiah says, tell us what is to come here after that we may know that you are God. Now this, uh, God is taunting uh, those idols and idol worshipers. And see how God taunts these idols. He says, you know, if you claim to be gods, or if you claim that these are gods, then let them tell us what the future will be, what will come here after. And we will know that this is, or these are gods. Right? So one of the criteria, I guess, for God to be God is to be able to know future, right? Or not just future, but all knowing, including what is to happen. So from these verses that I just you know, skipped around, it seems that first, God is all powerful. And secondly, God is all knowing, including the future. He knows the future and he will do what he's able to do, right? And it seemed like he can do all things. Right? So this is one of the evidence, uh, one side of the evidence that the Bible says. And if we stop here, it, it may seem like God always gets what he wants, right? Isn't it? Or doesn't it seem like that? However, let us continue. Now look at what Jesus says. Now, by the way, <laughs> let me just insert, these uh, texts are not the only texts that talk about these topics, these topics, okay? These are just uh, uh, selections that I've made. Uh, but there are other top, other verses that suggest or support these points. But for now, let's see what Jesus says. Now, this is taken from the very famous Lord's Prayer. You know, the, the disciples came to Jesus, asked how to pray, and Jesus tells them, here is how you pray. And in that prayer that Jesus teaches to his disciples, he says, your will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, isn't that interesting? I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that many of us here have prayed the Lord's Prayer before, maybe continually praying the Lord's Prayer. But if we uh, go back to the verse that we just read about, uh, said by Jesus, he said, with God, all things are possible. And yet, in this instance, Jesus is saying, your will be done. And the thing is, well, the implication is, I mean, why do we have to pray to God that his will be done? Like, why do we have to even ask him to, for that to happen if he can do all that is possible, all, all that he can, right? I mean, if God is always doing his will, then why does Jesus teach his disciples to pray that God's will be done? And furthermore, it is interesting that after your will be done, Jesus says, on earth as it is in heaven, which seems to imply that God's will is not as much done on earth as it is in heaven. Does that make sense? 
it seems like there's a limitation on this earth for God's will to be done compared to how it is in heaven. And it's not just the, this verse, but in other verses, we see uh, Jesus often talking about those who do the will of God. Those who do the will of God are my real brothers and sisters. You know, that's what Jesus says. Which seems to imply that there are those who do not do the will of God. Right? Luke, in his gospel, he writes, When all the people heard this, this referring to Jesus commanding John the Baptist uh, and the tax collectors too. They declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. And now listen. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected what? Rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Now that's a fascinating passage for me at least. I mean, can people reject the very purpose of God? Apparently, yes. The Bible says that the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose. God's purpose was otherwise. God's purpose was that for them, for them, the Pharisees and the lawyers, to have been baptized by John. And yet, they had the power, the ability to reject that purpose. And lastly, let me read uh, from Paul. I've uh, quoted from two epistles of his. But, and this should sound familiar, but in one place he says, God desires, you know, he wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And yet, in another place he says, those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Okay. So God wants, God desires that all people will be saved. And yet, we have an abundance of evidence in the Bible which says that not all people will be saved. So does God always get he, what he wants? Apparently not. There are times when God's will, God's purpose, God's desire may not be fulfilled. <laughs> Is this shocking to you? <laughs> or did you know this all the time? So though God can do all things, though God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing, and in fact, God is all-loving, and yet, he does not always get what he wants. And the question is, why? Why can't he? And there may be several complex reasons that we will try to uncover uh, bit by bit throughout the series, but one of the huge uh, reasons I think can be drawn from these verses. For example, from these, uh, this last uh, statement about salvation. Now, how are people saved? The very basic of Christianity, right? We say that it is by faith. It is by we accepting God's salvation. And even in that language, even in that sentence, it is implied that we can choose not to accept God's gift. Though it is God's will for us to accept that gift, right? Or in Luke's passage, how was it that God's purpose went unfulfilled? It was because these people rejected. These people had the choice to say no to God's will. And this we call free will. And for those uh, good Adventists who have especially read the Conflict of Ages series, I mean, this nothing, not, nothing uh, may sound new to you, perhaps, but this free will thing that is given to some creatures are so significant that we, as free beings, can reject God's purpose, God's will, God's desire. So at times, 
God cannot get what he wants, even though he has all the power to make things happen. Such a, such a big thing free will is, right? And why is free will given to creatures? Now let me read a quote from uh, this book, The Odyssey of Love. In this book, Peckham gives two lines of reasoning. Uh, reason. Uh, these are not all there is, I believe, but these two, I think, are helpful to understand why God has given us free will. And that is because love, which is at the very heart of God, which is at the very nature of God, requires free will. How so? He says, Scripture consistently depicts love as freely given and freely received. And he referenced Hosea chapter 14. But according to the Bible, the, the kind of love that the Bible talks about should be freely given and freely received. It is not something that could be coerced. Once it is forced, it no longer becomes love. And once uh, David Asherick, that famous pastor, David Asherick, on uh, one of his uh, YouTube, YouTube videos said, God is not a divine rapist. I hope so. Right. Once love is forced upon, that becomes evil. Right. So love requires free will because it is so. And the second reason and this goes along with what we have been seeing. Peckham puts it, the fact that God actually desires love relationship with free creatures who are capable of love as an end in itself, but does not enjoy love relationship with all such creatures indicates that love relationship cannot be determined by God. Now that may be a bit of a long sentence, but to put it simply, I mean, God is actually wanting to have this love relationship with all creatures, and yet he's not having it, and he will not have it, seems to suggest that this love relationship which God desires cannot be unilaterally determined by God. So we see that this love, this love relationship requires a freedom on our side, to freely choose to love or not. And here we see that we can choose otherwise than what God wills. And we know that, according to the Bible, God wills good things, right? So if we go willing against that, that might end up as evil. And to go a bit further. So what kind of free will do we have? And I'm sorry for this technical language he used, but he says uh, there are two characteristics to characterize this kind of, this free will that we have. First, he calls it epistemic, epistemic freedom. Epistemology is a study of knowledge, like knowing. And what he means by epistemic freedom is that freedom with regard to what one believes and does not believe. So we have a freedom to choose what to believe or not or not to believe. Right? And the second characterization he gives is consequential freedom. And he says, freedom to externally affect in the world what one internally wills to some limited extent. In other words, consequential freedom is to make things happen that is just in our mind. Now we have that freedom to actually actualize what we want to some limited extent. So. And I think these two characteristics of freedom that we have are well portrayed in the first uh, temptation in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, it says, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what did God say to Eve? You will die if you eat of it, right? So here, the serpent is contradicting the statement that was made by God. And the fact that either the serpent or God is lying seems to suggest that Eve has an option to choose 
which is the liar and which to whom I can trust, which one I can trust, right? If she didn't have that epistemic freedom, this temptation would be meaningless, right? And so in verse 6, it continues. So when the woman saw with her eyes that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And then she gave that to her husband and the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked. So I hope you see the kind of freedom that was given to humanity. Eve could make the choice whether to trust God or whether to trust the words given by this serpent. And she did choose the latter. And not only, this did not only happen in her mind, but she was able to actually touch the fruit and to actually eat that fruit. This peckham calls the consequential freedom. She was able to actualize what she wanted to do. Right? So this is a huge freedom that is given to humanity and yet is a requisite for love relationships. And unfortunately enough, humanity has chosen that other wife. Right. Now let me kind of sum up the points that I've been mentioning. First, the Bible describes God as all powerful and all knowing and yet as having unfulfilled desires. Now why is that the case? such as because some creatures with that given significant freedom can, and not only can, but have actually chosen otherwise, that is, evil. And this possibility, now this is an important uh, word, not actualization, okay? the possibility to choose otherwise, that is evil, is necessary for a love relationship, and that is, why God gave them freedom. And sadly, they have chosen otherwise. Thus, evil is to be attributed to the misuse of free will by the creatures. Right. Now, I hope these uh, make sense to you. And you may be wondering, well, we creatures have this strong freedom to choose otherwise than God desires. So what then does God get? <laughs> I mean, we say God can do all things. We say that God is all powerful. And yet if we affirm this kind of freedom on our side, like what does he get? What can he do? I mean, as a ruler of the universe, what can he do? We might ask. And to answer this question, I find this very helpful. This distinguish, distinction that Peckham makes in regards to God's will. Peckham says that we should distinguish God's will into two. And he calls the first one the ideal will of God. What is God's ideal will? He says, this will refers to that which would occur if all agents act acted in perfect accordance with God's desires from any point onward. In other words, God's ideal will is that will that if all creatures, if all three beings would freely do what God desires. That is God's ideal will. And an example would be, uh, that statement made by Paul, that God desires all people to be saved, right? That is God's ideal. God wants everyone to be saved. And yet, for that to happen, God cannot just decide for himself, but it includes all the people, all the creatures, to decide for themselves to align their desires with God. And there is this second uh, will, and Peckham calls this remedial will. 
And this remedial will refers to God's will that has already taken into account all other factors, including the wills of free creatures from any point onward. So in other words, remedial will is by using his knowledge of all that will happen by knowing, by taking into factors that all the creatures will do freely, he wills the best out of it. And this you may call the plan of salvation or plan of redemption, in which his ideal may not come, come true, or it doesn't actually. I mean, this situation right now is not God's ideal for sure. And yet, with his all-knowingness and with his all-powerfulness, he will bring the best out of it. This, and that is God's remedial will. And after saying this, now you may still be wondering, like, how can this be uh, uh, beneficial for us? I mean, this talk may sound logical, but not enriching for our actual Christian faith and daily living, you might say. And yet, I do believe that this is very important in more of a practical sense to know this distinction between ideal will, which does not happen, and this remedial will. Because, for example, and I will close with this, this notion, we often pray, if it is your will, then please do this or do that. We pray this way oftentimes, don't we? And after all, this is biblical, right? I mean, Jesus prayed, if it is your will, take this cup away. So nothing is wrong with that prayer. However, if we do not understand these two kinds of will, then we might fall into a misunderstanding. Let's say we pray for our loved one in sick bed. And we pray for this loved one's healing. And we say, if it is your will, please heal this person. And though you may pray fervently, this person may pass away. Now, how will you assess that? Will you say that it was God's will that this person be sick? and this person be dead. Really. And I believe that, yes, sure, God can bring, bring good out of any evil circumstances. I believe that. I believe that God can work out his great will. However, if we only have one conception of God's will, we may fall into thinking that evil is not evil after all. People being sick, getting sick, and people dying is not after all bad if it is according to God's ideal. Now, is that the God of the Bible, though? And I think this kind of prayer, without knowing what you are asking for, God's will, may be harmful to some people. Maybe some people who are not of our faith may think, well, I guess it is God's will, it is God's desire, it is God's want for this person to perish and not to hear or answer the prayer for healing. And yet, what I would like to, you to understand from this uh, sermon is that there are things that God is not capable of doing just on his own. There are much more factors involved in it, and though God may be truly, actually willing to heal this person, though God may actually be wanting from his heart, from the bottom of his heart, not for this person to perish, there are circumstances in which God may not be able to answer to that prayer in the affirmative. 
And I believe that that is very important for us to understand. Because though God's ideal will may not be fulfilled due to human free will, human misuses of free will, and other factors that we will deal, in, deal with later, we can be confident that God's remedial will, that God's best possible, uh, that the desire will come to pass. And with that, uh, Peckham says, God does not always get what he wants, that is, his ideal will, yet God will certainly accomplish his all-encompassing providential purpose, that is, his remedial will. And in that sense, we can confidently say and agree with this statement that God made. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. So when evil encounters us, and when we face those evils with struggle, and perhaps facing God and asking for help, let's not be so quick to judge what God's will is. Let's not assume that everything happens is God's ideal. Let's not tell people that all these things are what God desires. Because after all, the Bible is clear that though God wills the best for us, and though he has the power to do so, we can still reject that. And we have been rejecting that. And at the same time, I hope that we can be confident in this God that we trust. That this all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving God will in the end bring justice and bring mercy. And I pray that we will have faith in this God and the word of God that is given to us, that is in the Bible. And so that's it for today's message and just a short uh, appetizer. Just for you to come back uh, next week and the week later. Okay. I hope that some of you who have been keenly listening to this sermon may be already wondering, well, what about the cases when it seems like human free wills are not involved in the occurrence of evil. For example, like illness. Well, some illness may be caused by this person's own choice, but some others are not. Or what about natural disasters? Or what about the cases in which we think that God can prevent that evil without impinging on anyone's free will? I hope you are starting to think about those things because we will come back to those later, later because our free will does not answer all the questions. And I don't pretend that after this series all uh, questions will be answered, but I hope that more will be uncovered so that we may be able to have more faith in God who is loving, who is powerful, and who is knowing. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this occasion to look at and to struggle to see this difficult, and not, not only difficult, but this painful problem of evil that, that is really real to us. And may you give us wisdom, may you increase our understanding so that we may see in the Bible, in your word, that you are fully worthy to be trusted, even 
in the face of utter evil. And we pray that your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.